Last month, Saudi Arabia and Iran announced that they'd come to an agreement to normalize relations. That is a significant shift, no doubt. But the fact that China, customarily not a player in the political machinations of the region, helped broker that deal? Well, that makes it all the more potentially seismic. For some perspective on the significance of these events, let's welcome, in Vienna, Austria, Valina Chakarova, analyst and founder of the geopolitical consultancy FACE. In Washington, D.C., Vali Nasser, professor of Middle East Studies and International Affairs at Johns Hopkins University. In Harrisonburg, Virginia, Hussein Ibish, senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. And here in our studio, Besma Momani, professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and senior fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. And it's great to have you back here in our studio and to our friends in Points Beyond. Thank you for joining us on TVO tonight. Besma, to you first, this seems to have caught a lot of people by surprise. How big a surprise was it, do you think, for the sort of foreign affairs watchers? Not particularly if you've been watching the region. I mean, we've seen uh, both the Iraqis and the Omanis do similar overtures. In fact, I think we got to very similar terms of agreement that we saw the Chinese broker. But make no mistake, the fact that it was the Chinese that brokered this, uh, I think, was really fascinating. And in That's fact, it the took story. the Chinese, absolutely, it took the Chinese to be that security guarantor, to really put their reputation on the line, which they don't tend to do. As you said, they don't tend to really get involved in the Middle East region. For them to really put their neck out, uh, President Xi to personally be involved in this, I think, is really significant. Uh, I think they have taken really a lot of credit, where, frankly, credit was not due to them, because a lot of this <laughs> was negotiated by either the Iraqis or Omanis previously, and there was certainly willingness on both sides to be a part of this, but it was a win-win for the Chinese. I mean, who doesn't want to broker mm. such a peace, you know, quote-unquote, uh, type deal? So, absolutely, they, they're the winners in this. Valina, most media accounts seem to think that this was a very, very well-kept secret for a good chunk of time. Do you agree that it was? I wouldn't be surprised if that is the case. Uh, obviously, China emerged as a powerful uh, regional broker, uh, and yet you should be mindful of the fact that uh, China is not the only player on the ground. So I argue that uh, Russia has been helping a lot, uh, specifically when it comes to relations with Iran to facilitate and prepare the ground for uh, the Iranian-Saudi uh, deal. So in a sense, uh, I understand if that has been kept um, in secret uh, for an obvious reason to not, you know, um, reveal much in advance. Vali Nasser, let me set up this next question to you by quoting something that you wrote in Foreign Affairs magazine last month. And I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring up the graphics so people at home can read along as well. Saudi Arabia, you wrote, has set the ambitious goal of becoming an advanced industrial economy as well as a cultural and tourism hub by the year 2030. Achieving this will require U.S. military support, Israeli security and technology, trade with Europe and China, and domestic stability. The Saudi strategy is at odds with Washington's conception of regional security, which favors isolating Iran and does not rule out war, though there is no clear U.S. plan to manage it. In effect, Riyadh is showing that if U.S. policy does not serve Saudi interests, then the Saudis will not be beholden to the alliance. Okay, let's pick up on that. Saudi Arabia used to be in favor of isolating Iran. Clearly not anymore. What happened? Well, because the strategy did not uh, satisfy their needs. Uh, they, they want, they, it didn't end the war in Yemen. It did not uh, remove the Iranian threat to oil facilities, to their infrastructure. And in fact, it, uh, the, the escalation in the region created a situation where they would be uh, bloodied if, if it came to war with Iran. So Saudi Arabia has very clear objectives. Uh, it, it, it obviously uh, wants Iran to be caged. It wants issues in Yemen, in, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Syria addressed. But it also uh, needs security in the region to pursue its, uh, it, its agenda of, of economic growth, of being the hub of the region. And I think there was a lack of a, lack of a, uh, a confidence in that the United States' policy would get them there. So. They decided to take things into their own into their own hands. And let me do a quick follow-up with you in as much as which of the two countries do you think was more anxious to get this agreement in place? I mean, Iran has been much more anxious for much longer. They have been wanting to mend fences with Saudi Arabia 
uh, at least for the past five years. They, they, they made overtures. The Saudis were not biting. Even uh, the, the negotiations in Oman and, and, and Iraq, Iranians were much more eager to get to recognition. But the Saudis wanted guarantees. They wanted to make sure that the Iranians would do their part. And they, and they waited and waited until the opportunity came to, to leverage the Chinese to get what they wanted in terms of guarantees from Iran. Okay, Hussein Ibish, I'm going to do the same with you that I just did with Vali Nasser, namely read back something you wrote the other day for Bloomberg, mm -hmm. and here it goes. The Middle East, you write, is entering a multipolar era, and Saudi Arabia is maneuvering to find its place in this new reality. Washington understands this and indeed sees benefits in these evolving arrangements that it anyway cannot prevent. Despite the huge range of commitments, Saudi Arabia was extremely careful not to agree to anything that violates the fundamental American red line. Basically, don't do anything that gives China an undue strategic foothold in this crucial region. Okay, the headline on your piece in Bloomberg was, a flirtation with China won't rock the Saudi-US marriage. And that's what I want to follow up on. Are you really sure that um, Xi Jinping's charms are, are not going to get in the way of the U.S.-Saudi relationship? A hundred percent sure. Uh, China is not the threat to the U.S.-Saudi relationship, though there is one. I mean, I, I just want to say that China has emerged beyond its role of simply buying energy from Gulf countries into one where they do have an important and interesting diplomatic role. The U.S. couldn't broker this agreement. Uh, I, we heard talk before about uh, China being a security guarantor. It can't be a security guarantor. It doesn't have a security presence in the region. Only the United States as an outside power is uh, capable of playing that role. But obviously, Iran is not uh, neither talking to the United States nor interested in American guarantees under current circumstances. So the Chinese were able to play a useful role that I think was welcomed by everybody, including very cautiously by the United States. But I mean, ultimately, what you're looking at is, is a situation where the United States and Saudi Arabia remain uh, wedded to each other because they don't have alternatives. Or the United States, especially after uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, I think a lot of people in Washington, uh, strategic planners, have pulled out the maps and recalculated the global strategic landscape. And one of the things I think they realized is that U.S. security control and, and coordination over the three waterways around the Middle East, around Southwest Asia, that's uh, the, the Persian Gulf, the Arabian Sea and the Red Sea, plus the three choke points there, the Suez Canal, Bab al-Mandab at the mouth of the Red Sea and the Strait of Hormuz, is one of, if not the single biggest, geostrategic competitive advantage that the United States has over uh, rivals like China. So obviously working with local uh, you know, uh, partners like Saudi Arabia, and Egypt, Israel, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, this is extremely important to the United States. So it's no longer a question of oil for security or we protect you so you manage the oil markets for us. It's something much more mutual. It's starting to look a lot more like the U.S. relationship with uh, some European countries. I'm not thinking Britain and France, but you know, maybe Poland or Italy, something like that, you know, as, as Saudi Arabia emerges into this uh, new regional and international role of prominence and of influence because it, it dominates the, uh, the oil market, uh, you know, the U.S., I think, first of all, it can't stop it. And secondly, there are, as I said, some benefits. The, the, the big pitfall ahead is, is not China. It's um, it's Saudi Arabia's relationship with Russia in the context of well, OPEC. okay, hold on, don't we go, can talk don't more go about that. Yeah, don't go there yet because I'm not done with China no, yet. And that, and that, uh, Valina, pick up the story there if you would. I, I want to understand better the logic behind China's move into the heart of the Middle East at this juncture in Middle East history and in China's history. What do you see? Um, well, obviously, here, on the one hand, it's about diminishing influence by the United States, or if you like, um, let's say, um, on the interest, the geopolitical interest of the United States um, in the Middle East, which is now being described as West Asia, has diminished over the last uh, decade uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, the big uh, focus lies on the Indo-Pacific. And even uh, the war that Russia launched against Ukraine has not been really 
let's say, uh, on the top of uh, the geopolitical agenda of the United uh, States. On the other hand, we have a rising power, that is China, that needs to boost its diplomatic uh, portfolio. Uh, by the way, mm -hmm. once again, not uh, in an individual act, but really in coordination, very much in coordination with Russia, I would argue. And um, uh, still is not really eager to put, uh, well, to put boots on the ground. So it also needs, uh, you know, security provider. Uh, it was mentioned, the United States has played this role the role of a security provider. And I argue that China would probably, and this very much depends, in fact, on the outcome of the war in Ukraine, would very much rely on Russia and on Iran to actually, uh, let's say, um, play this role of, uh, you know, play, putting the boots on the ground uh, in the region. So it's really not only about the ad hoc um, effects from this deal, it's about the cascading effects that will result in uh, further uh, minor deals, uh, such as the normalization of the relations between Syria and Saudi Arabia. The normalization of the relations between S uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, we should not forget that. Uh, uh, and all of this will be put under, uh, under the umbrella of uh, geoeconomic influence coming from China. So it's, as was said, not only about the energy uh, exports, it's about the geoeconomic portfolio. And here, I think it's also about the hedging strategy of some of these players uh, on the ground, uh, hedging in a sense that they, of course, want to keep America uh, busy on the ground. They want America to be involved. We've heard already uh, about the importance of the global choke uh, points. Now, connect these choke points also with the Black Sea, uh, that is the most important global choke point for wheat exports, and you get the big picture. You still need this security provider for the control and the stabilization of um, of the maritime um, lines. So in a sense, it's going to be also about competition. And yes, we are seeing multipolarity at regional uh, level, but in fact, what we are also seeing is the bifurcation of the global system with two systemic rivals the creation of these centrifugal forces, the competition between the United States and China are in fact being manifested right now uh, in the hedging strategies of all these relevant players in the Middle East. All right, Besman, let me ask you about Saudi Arabia and what their interests might be here. I wonder if some of this is a bit of a thumb in the eye to the United States. Their relationship hasn't been fabulous over the last little while, needless to say. How much of Saudi's engaging with Iran is just to remind the Americans that, you know, we're here and we're in charge of our own affairs. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, yes, there is a messaging there for sure. Um, and partly because I think the Saudis, uh, and we know that uh, they made it very explicit, and perhaps even some leaks to the media that, you know, they were at one point even considering signing a peace treaty with the Israelis uh, if they were to provide them with the nuclear technology for civilian use. And the Americans rejected that. I mean, there's no shortage of, I think, analysis that certainly Mohammed bin Salman and, and, and Biden don't, don't get along. And even though we've had Biden go to, to Riyadh and make that very embarrassing to him, I think, you know, fist bump approach to try to mend relations. Uh, you know, the, Ameri the, the Saudis do think that the Americans are fickle. Uh, they don't feel it's trustworthy. I'm not suggesting that there's a fracturing of a really important structural relationship there. And let's not forget, if 9-11 didn't break, you know, the Saudi-American relation, I mean, frankly, you know, it takes a lot. Uh, the mm -hmm. point is there's a structural reasoning for why those two powers are very much, I think, kind of glued at the hip in, in the sense, uh, not only is Saudi Arabia the largest uh, importer of weapons, it's also the largest exporter of oil. Uh, the Americans, certainly as a dominant global economic power, want to see stability of markets on oil and prices. They no longer and never have really taken a lot of Saudi oil. So that argument of, you know, peace for oil was always missing an important argument. But mm -hmm. nevertheless, there are some structural reasons for why those two are really important to, to each other. But I do think that the Americans start to believe, and particularly I think the hit on Aramco was a really important turning point, that they just can't depend on the Americans like they used to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Trump, for all the fanfare, and, you know, they 
they've wined and dined him and, and, and certainly the sword dance and the rest to try and make this enormous overture to, to, to Trump. And at the end of the day, when the Ramco sites got hit, they didn't get the protection that they expected. They certainly didn't expect uh, or they certainly hoped for uh, a very stronger response toward Iran. And they never got that. And now they've got the Biden administration. Uh, you know, America looks very polarized from the outside, fractured from within. And so there are, I think, some hedging here, absolutely, to try and find other allies. And, and China is not someone to ignore. You know, there is a lot of interest of China in uh, advancing its Belt and Road Initiative. Um, the entire Gulf region is buying 5G technology that the, that the Chinese have. So there's enormous investment in the digital infrastructure. Um, they see still China as a very important, viable economic partner. Um, and so there's not going to be a turning away. And I think that the messaging here is twofold. One, to the Americans, you're not the only player in town, mm -hmm. right? And we've got other options, not just for uh, weapons, but for technology. Um, and despite, you know, Biden with his CHIPS Act and his IRA Act, they're not going to, I think, stop a lot of other countries out there, make deals where it's more profitable for them. At the end of the day, the Chinese have a very interesting offer of 5G technology, far cheaper, far better, far faster. And they all want to get on with developing their economy. So they're going to turn to the Chinese, absolutely. Fali Nasser, you're in Washington, so I want to ask you about reaction there. The official position of the U.S. government is that they welcome this move towards reconciliation. I want to know how sincerely we should take that. Uh, well, I think part of it is face saving, although as, as, as uh, Hussein said at the beginning, the, be the, the deal does benefit the United States. It means no major conflict in the region in the short run no threat to oil facilities that could jack up the price of oil and create inflation in the United States in the short run. And the United States can now focus much more on, on Ukraine and, and not worry about having to get engaged in a war. But I, I do think there is a certain degree of embarrassment uh, because of the way that this was put out. Uh, uh, that, because once you put the words China and Iran and the United States not in there, there there's, there's, a, there, there's attacks from the Republicans. There, there's also the way in which, I, exactly as Bassam said, that it's seen as the fact that the Saudis are, are basically saying very clearly that they don't trust the United States, they don't have confidence in the United States, and in some ways they are, they are moving into that multipolar environment. But I think there is, a, there is, at a deeper level, there is a, a great deal of um, worry, intrigue about Mohammed bin Salman. I, I think, you know, it, it's very easy to see this as about Iran or see it as about China. But I think the most interesting actor here is Mohammed bin Salman. By much evidence, he, he's the one who instigated this. He's the one who basically got Xi Jinping new energy deals only on the condition that it would help end the war in Yemen. And for me, the critical thing is when he got Xi Jinping on Saudi soil to criticize Iran and even say that Iran needs to solve its uh, islands dispute with UA through negotiations, which was like a chill of cold water on the Iranians, uh, to maneuver the Chinese into this position. And I think the Americans are worried about, as Bassam said, where does this go in terms of Huawei, in terms of other sets of things around the global uh, 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 world, given that Saudi Arabia is such a big economic player, and also the fact that Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman is really assuming a role of reshaping this region. Yeah. I mean, building yeah. ties with, with UAE, normalize, uh, sorry, with, with Turkey, normalizing with Qatar, and now with Iran, that this is not the Saudi Arabia that we knew. Okay. It's not just that it's matured and independent, but it has a yeah. complete geostrategy yeah. that is outside of, uh, of of this framework that Washington is used to thinking about the Middle East. So, yeah. you know, this, uh, the, the point is that the U.S. really doesn't have a plan for the Middle East, doesn't have a strategy for the Middle East. What is still peddling is the Middle East of the old, which clearly is not the Middle East we're seeing. Hmm. Hussein, let me get you to pick up on one aspect of Vali's yeah. answer there, and that is the issue of Yemen, where there's been a hmm. civil war for almost a decade. Yeah. Do, what, can you talk to us about what you think the prospects for a more peaceful Yemen are going forward, given this development? Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me just say, because I'm, I've you know, spoken with them pretty extensively, the, the, the White House at uh, the senior levels um, is, I think they were sincere in welcoming this, even though it's politically painful, right, as, as Vali and others were saying. At the same time, uh, they're skeptical that it's going to last. Right, I think that's really what underlies the perspective in in the White House right now about the about the agreement. They they don't give it a long shelf life. 
they are not sure it's actually going to work. And so until it does, they're not going to spend a lot of time sweating the details, right? And and I think that's where they are. Uh, in fact, I know that's where they are. Okay. Uh, How about on Yemen? Yemen? Yemen, yeah. So here's the deal, right? Saudi uh, delegation is supposed to go to Yemen, and to Sana'a in Yemen, and to meet with the Houthi leadership uh, and... It's, you know, it's a remarkable breakthrough. So I do think that Bali is right, that there was some pressuring of the Chinese. Uh, by the way, that uh, Saudis are not buying 5G technology from China. That's UAE. They, send it, they signed an MOU with the U.S. to do that. But they did pressure the Chinese to help deliver Iran on Yemen, and then they pressured the Iranians to help deliver the Houthis on Yemen. So it's a little bit of a, of a hopscotch. Uh, but it has gotten them there. They are seriously talking or going to talk uh, next week uh, uh, you know, to the Houthis about uh, resolving the war. And we'll see how interested the Houthis are in that, because until now, they've been believing that they could uh, achieve more on the battlefield than at the negotiating table. So we'll see if they're really ready to pull back from that. But it does look like they've exhausted what they can achieve on the ground. And if they were to be, uh, if they were to be reasonable, I think they can get a good deal out of the Saudis. They need to give the Saudis security guarantees that will allow Saudi Arabia to pull back uh, their troops into Saudi Arabia without the threat of rocket attacks, cross-border raids, bombs, and things like that. If, if they really get that out of the Houthis, and they, the Houthis make some kind of face-saving deal with the council, the presidential council, and that represents the, the uh, internationally recognized government, then I think you could have a deal and potentially the end of the Yemen war. It's okay, time. Let, let me pick up on that with Valina, and that is, do you think that China has the heft, do they have what it takes to replace the so-called American security guarantee with Saudi Arabia that those two countries have enjoyed for many, many decades now? Absolutely not in the short uh, and middle term, but obviously China will try to exercise uh, regional uh, power projection. Uh, let's not forget that in geopolitics, perception of power is power. And right now, the one side of the coin is how this... Uh, moves uh, by China are being perceived not only in the Middle East, but in the global south. Uh, think of the 12 points uh, peace plan that China promoted uh, on uh, the war in Ukraine. And think of uh, the, as I said, cascading effects when it comes to normalization of relations with other Middle Eastern powers. So this all will result in a growing uh, diplomatic uh, portfolio that China will use in the relations with third countries. Vali, as we look at the chessboard in the Middle East, I want you to help us understand this move in terms of what it means for Israel. Because, of course, Israel and Saudi Arabia for the last many years have been getting closer. Israel looks at Iran as, as, an, as an existential threat. And now, all of a sudden, a potential friend is making an agreement with Israel's worst sworn enemy. Does this leave Israel in the lurch, in your view? Well, definitely was not welcome in Israel. Uh, it largely means that uh, the Abraham Accord or any expansion of it will not be necessarily in the short run a, a, a military uh, war pact, uh, an Arab-Israeli NATO against Iran. So, so the expansion of the uh, Abraham Accords or when Saudi Arabia recognizes Israel will be much more about peace between Arabs and Israelis rather than being about Iran. And this idea of a Sunni Arab-Israeli access against Iran is, is right now neither here nor there. And, and, and on the other side of this is that the Palestinian issue is escalating. I think Iranians are also poking in that in, in, in ways to try to deep, deepen this wedge, with Saudi Arabia basically saying that Iran is no longer the kind of great threat that allowed them to overlook everything to make a deal with Israel, uh, perforce puts uh, other issues between Arabs and Israelis into, into sharper focus. So, I mean, Israel is itself, uh, the way it's handling the Palestinian issue is not helping itself. It's making it much more difficult for, for Saudis, et cetera, to, to, to move forward. And I would just add very quickly on the, on the, on the security factor. I, I do agree, the Chinese cannot provide Saudi Arabia security, but, but the Saudis are not looking for that kind of security from China. They're not looking for Chinese aircraft carriers to protect them against Iran. At this moment, for Saudi Arabia, the most important thing 
was that the Chinese are able to bring the deep state in Iran, the supreme leader and the IRGC to the table. And given yep. that that faction in Iran is the most pro-Chinese part, the likelihood of them behaving themselves mm -hmm. and not undermining uh, the deal uh, is the highest. And, and again, that was a very clever maneuver by Mohammed bin Salman. I do think it's time that people give him credit, despite all the negative publicity uh, that he's, he's got, that he's played a very deft strategic hand here. Yeah. Can I get you, Besma, on the issue of whether the Abraham Accords are not necessarily in trouble, but the notion of expanding them right now seems off? Oh, it's absolutely off. I mean, I thought it was off for a long time because I think Mohammed bin Salman got the message from his father uh, to basically say, you know, not as long as I'm alive. You want to do it the day after I die, that's fine. And, and we know that he's aging and ill. And, and so there's certainly a lot of overtures out there. There's an enormous number of B2B type, you know, business to business deals happening between the Israelis and the, and the Saudis. But I think the fact that you have extremists in, in Bibi Netanyahu's government right now really just puts that whole question to an end. I mean, they're not, you know, these are, these are uh, pyromaniacs inside Bibi Netanyahu's cabinet. And, you know, they're, they're extremists, with all due respect. I mean, they just absolutely have to be called that. Um, and so you just can't make a deal with that. In fact, we've seen in the UAE, they've been hosting some of the Israeli opposition parties to come, really sidelining Bibi. Bibi Netanyahu absolutely wants someone from the Gulf to come visit, particularly the UAE, after, you know, a flurry of really positive kind of bilateral relations, uh, at least on the TV sets. And so this has been a snub to BB, and I think what we're seeing really, frankly, is no hope for the Abraham Accords as long as he's got that government in place. And the fact is there have been hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Israel frequently, if not daily, frequently, Absolutely. protesting what's going on there right now. Hussein, let me get you in here on this, and uh, I'll quote to you the uh, American Middle East analyst Aaron David Miller, who wrote, anyone who believes that we're on the cusp of a golden era between Tehran and Riyadh in other words, between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, should lie down until the feeling passes. That's right. what he writes. What conflicts will keep these two countries at loggerheads as you look at the map? Uh, so Aaron is completely right. I think there some things can be accomplished from what's been established in Beijing and, and then, of course, with the Omanis and the Iraqis, who especially, you know, did a lot of the, of the uh, heavy lifting, as Basma was saying. Um, yeah, I mean, what you can do here is make progress on Yemen. You can restore diplomatic relations, right? I Iran and Saudi diplomatic relations and thawing and freezing has been going on for 100 years, and especially uh, clearly since the 1979 revolution. It's been up and down and back and forth. And now is a logical time for a thaw. So there's a thaw. It's, there's nothing surprising or unusual, particularly, or, or a historical or a huge breakthrough about this. You might be able to get an end to the war in Yemen, but then you move on, I think, almost immediately, because the Saudis are going to raise the issue of Iran's rocket and drone uh, arsenals, and the, the Iranians are not going to be willing to discuss in any serious way giving up or really limiting those game-changing arsenals, um, they're going to have to look for something else to discuss. And it's going to be the other conflicts in the region, Iraq, uh, Syria, and Lebanon, where, in theory, uh, stability would benefit both sides, but stability on whose terms? And it becomes very complicated. Where you can see some room for perhaps for cooperation might be in Syria, but uh, without uh, more cooperation uh, on Iraq, it becomes hard to formulate how exactly that's going to work. And it's more likely that both countries continue to do their thing. The Saudis, I, I know, are hoping that intensified Israeli pressure and the way things are going in the region would sort of uh, ease Iran to the margins a bit in Syria. I think they're being very optimistic about that. Uh, I think they keep coming up with these theories about how Iran and Hezbollah are going to be marginalized in Syria, and, and it never happens. And the reason it never happens is they're in a very strong position on the ground, and Bashar al-Assad does not have uh, any alternative to relying on them for certain things, even though he would want to be free of their influence, of course. But he doesn't have that option. So as long as that's the case, uh, this is a pipe dream. So they, they may negotiate about things like that. But I, I think restoring diplomatic relations and and uh, getting some kind of an agreement on Yemen that allows Saudi Arabia to withdraw its troops is more than enough heavy lifting for this agreement as it stands now to bear. Valina, let me ask you whether you are seeing a China on the move in the Middle East 
as part of a bigger, more coherent strategy? And if so, what is it? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, what I see is uh, a unique Asian power that, uh, in fact, strives to convert its geoeconomic cloud into a geopolitical power projection, not only in the direct vicinity, that means East uh, China Sea and South China Sea and the Indo-Pacific, uh, that means also the maritime domain, but also the terrestrial domain. It's a unique position because both United States and before that Great Britain have become uh, global powers based on maritime power projection. Now, China is um, applying a hybrid approach. Uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, trying to create all these terrestrial corridors, um, that means also via West Asia. That is why China needs stability. China needs predictability. And here, I think uh, one of the reasons why uh, the Middle Eastern powers have been hedging uh, significantly is because they see the bigger picture. They see this emerging systemic conflict. Uh, uh, and by the way, it's not a direct confrontation between United States and China. It's much more long-term oriented competition. Uh, so mm. here, uh, specifically when it comes to connecting West Asia uh, to uh, Central and uh, South Asia, think of Afghanistan. So this was not the first case where, you know, China was confronted with a new situation with the security vacuum because of the withdrawal of the United States. Uh, so this is a continuation. And obviously, uh, the main target is the industrial heart in Europe. Uh, China has been targeting the soft belly uh, of Europe, that is the former Soviet space, uh, the Central Eastern European countries. Now we are seeing the counter uh, reaction uh, by some of these countries. The Baltic countries exited the 14 plus one uh, initiative. So in a sense, uh, this success story is uh, very important to China. And what we are going to see is also the continuum when it comes to uh, winning the hearts and minds of the so-called Global South, uh, be it in Africa, in Latin America, and obviously, once again, this success story needs to, uh, you know, um, needs to prove uh, the, uh, or let's say let, needs to survive the test of the time. So China will be investing a lot economically um, for to make it to make it possible. Okay, just a couple of minutes left here, and I want to see if I can uh, get on two more things. Vali Nasser, can I get you to as well weigh in on what you see as China's bigger long-range game plan here? Well, I think Valina is absolutely correct. China looks at West Asia uh, essentially as a, as a zone of expansion, and, and uh, it, it wants stability, predictability there, uh, unlike the United States, which, whose policies in the region have been largely uh, through military and, 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 and has, and has put, been positioned between the Arabs and, and Iranians. The, Ch the Chinese's interests are, are economic, are, are, are uh, ge geographic. And they benefit actually from reduced tensions between them. They don't benefit if uh, from Saudis and Iranians and UAE fighting when they actually mm -hmm. are doing business with all of them. They don't like that situation. And and at the same time, also, you know, the, the, the Iranians are becoming a major corridor for for uh, in West Asia for China, but also more importantly for Russia. Uh, a lot more of Russia's exports is going in and out of Iran. Uh, the, the Chinese also see that sort of a possibility with Iran given where they're going with the United States. And, and, and I think, you know, they're looking to, to West Asia in ways of, look, of going around what the United States is doing with the Quad in, 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 in East Asia. The more the United States invests in building naval capabilities there, the more the access to, to the world through West Asia becomes important. So for the Chinese, this is not about poking their finger in the United States' eyes in the short run or getting cheap gains here. It's really a, a much longer term investment. Right. Down to my last 30 seconds here, Besma, I have to ask you the obligatory Canada question, which right. is, do we have any dog in this hunt? Are we players in any of this at all? Not really. Uh, I think that's that's the honest truth. I mean, certainly we have uh, long-standing sort of engineering and um, exports in terms of oil and gas in the Gulf region. So certainly some stability there is always good for us, I think. Uh, and, and the Gulf is an important economic partner uh, for Canada in terms of investments. Uh, certainly nothing, you know, at the end of the day, it's always going to be dwarfed by the Americans. So that's just the reality. But collectively, the Gulf region is a very important, I think, economic partner for Canada. So that's always been there. Uh, and, you know, the 
more that the Chinese invest, of course, it makes things more complicated for us. As we all see, this has now become a really thorny issue for Canada. Indeed. Absolutely. So that, I think, is going to be something for us to watch. Gotcha. Mr. Director, a foreshot of our guest, please, so I can thank Valina Chakarova in Vienna, Austria, Hussein Ibish in Harrisonburg, Virginia, Vali Nasser in Washington, D.C., Besma Momani here in our studio, she of the University of Waterloo. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on TVO tonight. Thank Great you discussion. So much. Wonderful, Steve. Thank you so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.